I see that the doors have closed. It's now official, right? We need to start. Welcome to the second uh, personal financial planning lecture series. Uh, tonight we have an outstanding speaker from Pennsylvania who will be talking about uh, Marcella Shell leasing. Uh, but uh, we'll let uh, our moderator, Professor Mark Abramovic, do the introducing in a moment. First, I'd like to thank the friends of the Personal Financial Planning Lecture Series. Uh, without their generous support, we could not have uh, this wonderful series. Uh, Federated Investors, BNY Mellon, Dollar Bank, Heffern Tillotson, The Second Half Coach, and TIAA Cref have been generous, and we uh, look forward to continue working with them in the future. Uh, tonight, uh, Professor Mark Abramovic will be introducing our speaker, so welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ricolia. Um, this is a, a, an interesting evening for me because, as some of you know, I spent 30 plus years in the energy industry, specifically oil and natural gas, and that's really what we're going to be talking about tonight. Marcellus Shale, Utica Shale, and a lot of you hear about this almost on a daily basis now. It's in the newspaper, it's on the radio, it's on TV. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the surface or the land rights that go along with the whole concept of exploring for natural gas and oil. And we have a wonderful speaker in Doug Clark. Um, Doug is a, a native of Western Pennsylvania, went to Kiskey High School, is a graduate of the University of Akron Law School, migrated to northeastern Pennsylvania. And the northeastern corner of Pennsylvania really is ahead of where we are in southwestern Pennsylvania in terms of the development of the Marcellus Shale drilling activity. So Doug can help us understand the wave of development or the wave of the economic development that is, supports uh, this significant um, energy play in the United States. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Doug Clark. Before Doug starts, though, um, the rules of the road for questions. Doug will go about 45 minutes, let's say, with his prepared remarks. When questions pop up, please write them down on the card that's on your seat so that you don't forget them. When Doug is done, I'll ask you to uh, move your cards to the aisles, and we'll have some students that will pick them up, and we'll answer as many of the questions as we possibly can. We'll try to keep the session tonight to about an hour or an hour and 10 minutes. Okay, Doug, you're up. All right, good evening, everyone. And you know, I want to thank Mark and Nicholas. It's been already a great experience for me. Um, I only have 45 minutes or so, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tell any jokes or anything because I really have to move this fast. I, uh, I have a weekly radio show that I've been doing since August of 2010 devoted to Marcella Shell, Utica Shell, and natural ga gas development in Pennsylvania. So I, I think we have about over 125 hours of shows that are available on the websites. So I can certainly fill 45 minutes pretty easily. So I got a lot to cover and I want to try to make this interesting. And I think uh, these concepts are interesting. And like I said, it, hundred and some hours to choose from, so I tried to whittle it down uh, to what I thought would be a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, just to, if interested, and again, if you say, wow, that 45 minutes wasn't enough, you can go to the websites. Uh, we have all the shows archived uh, for all the students. Uh, we're also on iTunes, uh, which I just like to say because I think it's really neat and I've never <laughs> sung a song in public in my life. Um, so it's just, uh, it's just amazing, and, and the work that I do, and, and jumping off topic in a second, I do so much through the internet, and I probably don't meet about 80 to 90 percent of my clients. I'm in northeastern Pennsylvania, but I have clients in Washington County, Armstrong County, Butler County, Beaver County, uh, Westmoreland County, uh, Erie, all different places all across the western part of the state, and of course, uh, where I am located. I do nothing but natural gas representation. Uh, unless I have friends or family that get DUIs, which thankfully doesn't happen very often. Uh, but that's all I do, and it's all I've done for the last five years or so. And it's what I do literally seven days a week unless I'm on vacation, and I do try to take some vacations. Um, so 
you know, this is, I don't know of anybody from the, and I only represent landowners. I've never represented the company. I never will represent a company where, you know, I fight for my farmer clients, my, you know, landowner clients or gas right owner clients. So we're very proud of that. And I don't believe there's very many people out there that can say that they do what I do. So you know, really uh, deal with these topics every single day. You know, Mark will talk about this wave, and that's actually a concept I use all the time. In Pennsylvania, you know, we're out, I'm in the northeastern part of the state, and the gas development has really been a wave from the northeastern part to the western part. Now, of course, uh, I grew up, my grandparents had a farm in Armstrong County, my parents have that now, uh, and there's been gas leasing, and I remember as a kid, that my parents always wanted to have a, a gas well, or my grandparents on the property, because they wanted to get free gas. So the day they got the gas well was pretty exciting because we were able to get free gas and keep the heat up real high in the winter and everybody was comfortable. Um, so you know, gas leasing originated here and there's a large body of law from the 1800s, but really there was not this big money uh, involved. So there wasn't all these legal disputes and all this legislation that's developed. But starting around 2007 into 2008 in the northeastern part of the state, things really, really blew up. And offers went from where when I grew up, if you got $5 an acre for leasing your property, that was a great deal. Well, they start, first started coming to me in the northeastern part of the state with property that we owned and my family and, and neighbors at like about $100. And it quickly escalated up to $500. And then it went to $750 per acre. So we're in a situation where, wow, this is becomes really interesting because if you have 100 acres, you're talking about a $75,000 check, where the most people were getting you know, five years ago was $5. So this is an enormous difference. So what happens then is, is a bunch of people sign at $750. Well, very shortly after that, and literally, for some people, a matter of days, the price went from $750 to $1,500 an acre. It went from 12.5% royalty, and I'll talk about that, to 15%. Within six months of that, it went up to $2,500 an acre. So if you had 100 acres, now you're looking at a quarter million dollar check. And what they did, though, of course, they targeted these larger landowners earlier with the shorter or sh uh, you know, smaller bonus money, but that's the way things escalated. It really peaked, despite what you want to hear or what people will tell you, as a general peak, it really peaked at about $5,750 an acre. So again, in that example, if you had 100 acres, you're talking about $575,000 and 20 or 21 percent royalty. So there are people who signed at, in one area, they would sign at, you know, one neighbor might have signed their $100 at, or 100 acres, excuse me, at $100. Uh, per acre. Their neighbor, who maybe lived in New Jersey or New York or was holding out or didn't know what was even going on, but they may have signed their property at $5,000 or $6,000 an acre, right beside each other. And I have had clients who have obtained over $6,000 uh, per acre, but that is rare. And, and you go on the internet and so much available information is available on the internet but you go on the internet and there's a lot of misinformation too. So you, know, you can't read every, or you can't believe everything you see out there, but I can tell you the numbers that I see in representing a whole lot of people. So okay, let's get rolling here to some of the, the details. Now is leasing right for you? Now I know here probably is not a lot of property owners and probably a lot that are just a lot that are sitting there looking at uh, should I lease right now. But just as a concept, you know, I always preach that leasing is an individual decision. Many people uh, don't want to lease, so they're against it. And I, say, I support that and understand that. But my point is always that you want to be educated. You want to understand the terms of the lease. You want to understand the development, what really is going to occur. And you know, you're, the big, easy benefit to see is the money. And believe me, not everybody is a millionaire, not everybody's getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, and not everybody's getting tens of thousands of dollars. But money is real easy to calculate. <laughs> property impact and potential property impact is always going to be a negative. The biggest negative that I hear from my clients and landowners are, or is, I never expected the development to be so severe or so significant. I have one client who has a well pad and access road combined is 27 acres. Uh, I have several clients who have or surface operations on their property in excess of 20 acres. 
um, but normally we see 10 to 20 acres. I've had older clients of mine say, I would give them all their money back if they would just go away. Uh, I have other people that say, drill in my living room. Can you drill yesterday in my living room? So you have to understand all of these different things. So you know, you gotta understand if I take this, or I, I sign this contract and I take this money, well, what is gonna re what's gonna be the result of that? And you also have to really understand uh, you know, today's market and what you can get. And I have the realistic expectations. I can't tell you how many times, and one of the biggest parts of my job now is to educate my client to understand what expectations they should actually have. Because I talk about, you know, you can't believe everything you read in the internet. Well, in 2008, I'm going to go to the next slide here. In 2008, we, we deal with leverage. So, you know, how do I get $6,000? You know, I want to have $6,000. I've yet to meet a client come into my office or I talk to them on the phone who doesn't want the highest amount of money ever paid and actually a little more than that. So what happened was in 2008 and 2009, leasing was driven, when I said that escalation of $100 to $5,000 in the matter of a year, that was really driven by this whole herd came to town concept where back in those days I would be negotiating leases for clients with maybe five or six different companies at the same time. If I could think of a term to write, if I could write it down on paper, I could get it from one of them. Well, those times have changed drastically. The same thing, and this is a funny story I tell, uh, when I first started doing this, I had to deal with my clients because clients were very concerned. A lot of these people hadn't hired lawyers before. I wanted to be fair. I wanted to make sure they knew I'm not a gimmick. I'm here to try to help you. So my deal was is you don't have to pay any money. I'm not a used car or a, a ambulance chasing kind of attorney. But you don't have to pay any money unless we do a contract that you accept and is agreeable and you get paid for that. And so that made people very comfortable. It was a great arrangement. And it worked really well when the price was all at $750 an acre. But the second it went to $1,000 an acre, every deal that we were close to signing immediately went away because people said, whoa, things are changing. So we'd get close to doing a deal at $1,000 an acre. And then another company would find out. And they would call and say, we'll give you $1,100 an acre. Or instead of 12 and a half, we'll give you 15%. And then instead of 15%, we'll give you 15 and a half. So I went for about six months where nobody would sign a contract because the numbers kept going up and up and up. So I said to my wife, I said, what the heck did I do? This was the worst decision I ever made because nobody would sign. And then, which was fine, but we'd work, put all this work into things and we'd get the deal almost done and somehow they'd get with uh, a different company, which is fine. I'm here to help my client. But they would find out, hey, this these group of people may be signing, so they would call and up it by like a half a percent. And so we'd have to start all over with the contracts. Well, one company pulled their offers in one area. And I make the joke, there was like a line of people at my door to sign because they're terrified that these numbers would go away. So ultimately, I learned my lesson. We didn't necessarily do things like that all the time. But to give you an idea of how these numbers um, you know, escalated. So, how did the numbers escalate? They escalated because of this competition, but also the geology of an area. So now, the market is so different. I said, you know, when you talk about the internet, a lot of people come to me and say, well, I read that somebody got 16, or 6,021 percent. That's what I want. Well, there's no herd in town anymore. It's very rare that you can get two companies leasing or, or bidding on the same parcel. Well, when there's no competition, you have a major problem where you're trying to drive this money up. So despite geology, we have clients who are sitting in areas where we know are tremendously productive, some of the most productive areas in the state and actually really in the world. But there's only one company that's going to bid on it because they own all the other leaseholds around and it's not big enough for other companies to develop. Even if it's 100 acres, even if it's 200 acres or 300 acres. I had a client with over 400 acres, and he was convinced he was going to get $8,000 and 25%. And it came down to ultimately this statement from the company, not to the client, but to me, saying, look, your client says to you, these guys can make $50 million off of my property, which was maybe true, you know, whatever that number was, but it was tens and tens of millions of dollars off of this property. However, he can only make $10 million from us. So if he doesn't want to take the deal we're offering him, he doesn't have to.
but we're just going to go around him because we have 170,000 acres that we can produce all around him. His 450 acres aren't that big of a deal to us. But that's his only chance of making 10 million, and we'll give him 1 million right now. If he doesn't like it, tell him that's fine, but he has until Friday to decide. So that herd mentality, if I had somebody else that I could bring in, he would assign a much, much higher lease. Leases that went for 6,000, 5,750, 20, 21% are going as little as $500 and 15% now because there's no competition. And I've seen it as little as zero dollar bonus and 15%. So competition is really driven this price. Now, the next thing I want to show you is, you know, every client that, com <laughs> that comes in, um, not every, but most of them believe that they're sitting on the hot spot. Uh, apparently the whole state is pretty hot because everybody I talk to is on the hot spot. But one of the things, again, that I have to try to educate my clients is that even if you're on the hottest of hot spots, even if you, you get float in the air when you walk on your property because there's so much gas beneath it, it doesn't mean that you're going to get the deal that you want to get. So I use this example here. You take this little guy on the top there in the red. That guy there, these, this square would represent a production unit, and that's where they draw gas from. And the companies form this unit which is drawn a map on the, you know, that they file at the courthouse. And say there's, we'll make it simple, 600 acres in this square. Well, this guy at the end, maybe he, he's unleased. So he says, hey, this company wants to make some money. Uh, we want to get money. We're going to get this money. They're going to develop from us. So we want a higher lease or a better lease offer. But what they do is instead of going and drawing that square there, they just draw it a little short. So he really has no leverage. They just don't include him. As long as they don't drill underneath him or her, they don't need to include that property. The same thing here, this guy in yellow. Instead of having that line going straight, they just bring it over a little bit, and they're not included. So you can sit there and have your property sitting right there, and they're getting this gas from this unit. And on the other side, they would just draw the unit closer, perhaps. I'll show you something else in a second. But if you don't lease, and what happens a lot of times, people either hold out because they're against it, hold out because they're mad, they want more numbers, they want bigger, uh, better lease offer. If you don't lease, you could sit there and all your neighbors are going out to their mailboxes and getting these royalty checks, and you're going out and getting your standard junk mail. So a lot of times what we see now is people going out, and you know, I have a lot of clients now, they call them donut holes, these people that kind of held out or didn't want to do things for whatever the reason. But a lot of them are signing now, and we're doing a lot of what they call no surface leases because they didn't want to have their, their surface touched. So now they're entering into leases and say, you can't touch my surface, and I can still get royalties, which is a really great thing. But they're typically discounted quite a bit because now the companies are really squeezing them. And that's another thing. If anybody out here is dealing with a landman or a company, always please understand that they're not your friend, uh, they're not your partner. And we, we do deal with them, and eventually there is, can be a partnership, but there's no partnership until that lease is signed, and sometimes even development. Because the companies, and we've seen it, in 2008, we all had arms around us from the companies. We want to be your friend, we're your friend, we're your partner, we're going to be great together, we're going to, your house, is, your yard will look like a golf course, this is going to be fantastic, it's going to be three acres. Well, that's what they said to the guy who has a 27-acre pad and ponds and things like that on the property. Well, they're not, you know, the second they got leverage when there wasn't the herd in town, now when they're your friend at 6,000 and 20 percent, they're not so friendly at zero and 15 percent. They're not so friendly when they say you have until Friday to sign or see you later, we're cutting you out. They're friends when they need to be your friend. And they're not necessarily, well, they're not your friend when they don't need to be your friend. Uh, so they've been doing this for, <laughs> it's not, they're from Texas, you know, this isn't, not all of them Oklahoma, but it's not their first rodeo. You know, they've been doing this for a very long time, and they've done it all across the country. And thankfully, though, we live in a more, you know, with a technological age and the internet, that we have the ability to communicate and get this information out to people so we can learn from what's happened in the past. So the final thing, you say, okay, well, here, this guy in the purple there, pink, he has a lot of leverage. He's right in the middle. How can they drill underneath him? And what can they do? This guy can really hold out. He has a big donut hole. Well, 
until they drill that well underneath them, and they won't drill underneath him or her until they're leased, what they do, they can put, they'll just draw this line here, or they'll draw that line there, and they can put the pad here and go that way, or they can just extend the unit here and go that way. And no matter where you sit, you don't have leverage if you don't have competition. And when you have other companies, sometimes, and it's a business model with companies, some companies will, even though, um, and I hate to use the names because it's being recorded, <laughs> but we'll say this, um, Cabot Oil and Gas has done a very nice job of continuing to keep pretty reasonable offers on the table in areas that are very productive. But there's some other companies, I had a Western Pennsylvania case where a client calls me and says, hey, I got this lease offer, you look at it, uh, you know, they tell me I'm on a deadline, can you check it out? So he sends it in, I review it, I said, well, I have some problems with it, but I called the company and I said, can you tell me, is this a typo? And I, very respectfully, uh, it says $2 an acre. And the gentleman who was actually at the company at a higher level and was a smaller company said, yes, we're going to drill this and there's no bore under it and your client can take the $2 an acre or just be out of the unit. So that's the type of thing that we're seeing now uh, very often. So you really, some companies will because the acreage is value and they're valuable and their business model is a little different, not squeeze landowners so much, but other companies are, are what I consider ruthless at times, but they have that power. So I talked some, uh, and I want to get to some of this stuff later. Um, your two financial parts. You have the lease bonus, which is that price per acre that they pay you. And that's what I've been talking about. If you had a 100-acre farm and they offered you $100, and then it goes up, to, and they'll pay you that after you sign the lease. Now, there's a little delay in that lease because, or payment because they search your title to make sure somebody else doesn't have your gas rights. Once they verify that, which is usually 90 to 120 days, you get your check. There's another thing that we have out in western Pennsylvania, which is more of a straight lease. So here's an interesting thing. You may hear this $5,000 per acre. I have this right now with a western Pennsylvania client where we have one lease that's a paid-up lease. So if you sign the lease, the company is going to pay $5,000 for each acre you have. So again, you have 100 acres. That's a half a million dollar check. I have another client where the company tells my client and my client again, they, they know how to say these things, calls me and says, hey, I have this $5,000 per acre offer. When they send me the offer, it's not what they call a paid up lease where they give you all $5,000 per acre at once. It's $1,000 per acre per year or each year for five years. So every year you get $1,000 and that's what we do that for up to five years. But the day they commence operations, they don't have to pay any more of that bonus money. A paid up lease, they have to pay it all at once, and that buys them five years of time. A straight lease, they lease you, but they don't have to give you all that money at once. They, it depends on the terms. In this case, it was we give you $1,000 per acre each year. Well, I said, well, no, we don't want to do this. So we call the company and say, hey, uh, will you give us all the money at once? No. Um, but we're not going to plan, we don't plan on doing anything for several years. So, so well, that's great then, good. At least, uh, how about we say you give us three years of money up front? Well, no, no, we can't do that. How about two years? No, no, we can't do that. So you can only guarantee us one payment, you know, assuming you pay. Yes, but we don't plan on doing anything else. So the other part to this is the commencement didn't even require drilling. It required permitting. So they follow, they pay them once, they file a permit, they don't get any more money. So obviously a paid up lease is a much better lease. We talked about you have the order of payment, which is a document you get when you sign the lease. Then they do that title search, which takes about 90 to 120 days, and then you get that payment. The next part is, I'm going to skip through a couple of these because I want to get into some more detail on this. The royalty percentage. You get this bonus when you sign, assuming you have good title with your gas. Then the next part is, is the royalties. And what you'll hear all the time from land guys is royalties where the big money is, royalties where the big money is. And sometimes that's true. But I've had many clients where they've leased their property and it's turned out to be a dry area. So, you know, you get your bird in the hand, uh, you want to maximize both numbers, um, but every circumstance is different. So when you're engaged in these negotiations financially, you want to maximize, obviously, that bonus money. You want to get as much money as you can up front. 
but you also want to get the highest royalty percentage. And royalty percentage is paid on production. So once the wells start being produced, that's where you start getting these royalties. And they can be very substantial. But in some cases, they're not very substantial at all. Okay, the biggest case, and this is a very, very interesting issue, and I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as I can, but it's, it's a very interesting issue. And if you follow anything after tonight, this is a fabulous issue. Uh, the, the Kilmer case is the biggest case of royalties in Pennsylvania, and I'm going to blast through pretty quick and explain this. But this case said Pennsylvania has a guaranteed minimum royalty act saying everybody has to get 12.5% royalties. So this case went to the Supreme Court, or I'm sorry, it went to well, yeah, Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and what it was about was this. Gas comes out of the ground at the wellhead, pretty simple. It's not typically sold there. It's transported, it may be processed, it may be compressed, dehydrated, separated, different procedures that it goes through in order to, be mar or to go to market and to be sold. So typically, gas comes out of the ground at the wellhead. Typically, it's not sold there. It's gathered, transported, processed, dehydrated, compressed, and sold downstream at a cell point, which is often a transmission line, a major interstate line. So what it was happening is, is landowners would get their check. Well, obviously, the gas is worth more at this cell point after it's processed and moved and transported. So let's say that the gas is worth $4 there, but it costs a dollar to transport it, process it, gather it, do all of these procedures. So at the well, when you deduct that or you net that price back, say it costs a dollar to get it there. So it's worth $4 here, but $3 at the wellhead. So landowners said, hey, I'm getting my royalty check, but I'm not getting 12.5% of gas calculated at $4. They're taking these deductions, and you'll hear this word, deductions. So I'm getting my gas calculated at $3. I'm guaranteed 12.5% royalty by law, so they can't give me 12.5% of $3. They need to give me 12.5% of what they sold it at. And that's what the issue was in this Kilmer case, real big case. So that process of going back from $4 and taking those deductions is called the net back method. So the question was, is could you do this net back method? And this was just the Guaranteed Minimum Royalty Act saying you're guaranteed 12.5%. So the question, this net back method that I just talked about is that can you take the deduct from that sell point these different costs to get you back to the wellhead. Now, the Kilmer case had a provision in it, and this is really important, that said that clearly in the lease that gas royalty payments were to be one-eighth, which is 12.5%, less, and then in yellow, all of the costs actually incurred from the wellhead to the point of sale, including gathering, dehydration, compression, and so on. So it's pretty clear that this lease said that they were allowed to do that. Very clear in this case. So this, that lease contained that language. It didn't contain any other language I'm going to talk about in a second. So the Kilmer case held, the Supreme Court said in Pennsylvania, that yes, the Guaranteed Minimum Royalty Act does permit calculation at the wellhead. And in this case, uh, it was specifically discussed in the lease itself. It was expressly stated that they could use that calculation technique. So they also said that they left open the doors that landowners could negotiate for alternative royalty calculation methods. And that's what occurred. So starting in about 2008, and you see a little bit too, before then, you see negotiations by way of addendums that get added to the agreement. And those addendums, there's a form and they supersede or trump the terms of the lease. So we have, I'm going to just, Chesapeake has a similar lease, a form lease, that also allows for less the cost of transportation and those deductions. So similar to what we looked at. So landowners started negotiating and say, hey, I don't want this $3 gas price, I want the $4 gas price. So what happened was a very common term came up, and it was called the market enhancement clause. And again, this ultimately leads to a billion dollar issue for landowners and the state. So the market enhancement clause says that gas shall be paid to the landowner. This is something companies provided to the landowners and said, and 
usually typically represented that there wouldn't be deductions with this. You would get the $4 gas. So they said gas royalties shall be without deduction for those costs, transporting, gathering, marketing, compressing, to make the gas into marketable form. However, any costs that result in enhancing the value of marketable gas could be deducted. So no deductions to make it marketable, but once it's marketable, if we enhance it, then we can take those deductions. And I asked people at the time, well, what, what, what type of enhancement? I had heard answers like an, an odorant. If we put chemicals in the gas or if we, we do things like that, that's something that could be deducted. Never once was it ever represented that I know of in, in many negotiations that this would be a deduction for such items as transportation or gathering. So what do we do then? Clients are calling in, they're complaining, they're saying, hey, this isn't right. We said, we agree. So we write to Chesapeake, and they're my number one target here. We write to Chesapeake and say, hey, you can't do this. There's a market enhancement clause. You, can't, you need to pay my client $4 gas, not $3 price on gas. Chesapeake writes back, this is a real letter from an attorney at Chesapeake, who says, gas is in marketable form at the wellhead. And they say that we actually sell the gas, says gas produced from the lease in the second, or the first yellow highlight, you can't read, but it says gas produced from the lease is in marketable form at the wellhead. And is sold by Chesapeake to Semi at this point. Well, I see somebody smiling. Um, SEMI, C-E-M-I, stands for Chesapeake Energy Marketing Incorporated. So it's a 100% fully owned affiliate that they say is sold at the wellhead. So they say that the wellhead then costs to the point of sale, these transportation and gathering, okay, those are being deducted. And what I highlighted at the bottom is that market enhancement language that I just read to you, that you can't deduct anything to make it marketable, but you can for enhancements. So they then claim Costs and deductions are permitted because they enhance the value of the gas. So what we have is, we have Chesapeake and, and Anadarko is another company that says that when gas comes out of the ground, it's marketable. So therefore, by us transporting it and, and moving it to these other places, we're enhancing that gas. Well, what's fabulously interesting is Chesapeake sold a bunch of their leases. They have a partnership with a company called Statoil. And there's other, and I'm going to be briefer because it gets more complicated, but make it simple. Chesapeake has a, every lease that they own in Pennsylvania that I'm aware of, they have a part ownership with Statoil that they sold for capital and have as a partner. Well, Statoil doesn't take a dime of deductions. Chesapeake takes 100% of deductions. It's the same exact lease. It's not different leases. It's the same exact lease. I have clients that have deductions that are closing in on 100 thousand um, dollars. This deduction issue will go on, the deductions if they're taken for lifetime will be billions of dollars. You'll hear horror stories and there is an area of Pennsylvania where deductions are as high as in the 80 percentile. So you can have a client who's getting a thousand dollars in royalties they would be if they got that four dollar price in my example, but are only getting 200. That's very, very rare. Okay, that's rare, but you'll, those make headlines and things like that. Um, but there are many places where those numbers range from 20 to 50 percent difference. And we're talking about the lifetime of this lease. So there's the question of what's marketable and what's marketability. Can you sell to an affiliated company or not? And so what happened was, well, what do we do? You know, I have all these clients. This is what I focus in. This is what I specialize in. And, and to abbreviate this, we file a lawsuit in arbitration for class action arbitration saying, hey, you can't do this. Your partners aren't doing this. I can rattle off seven companies that aren't treating it this way, but you and this other company, Anadarko, are. So they don't respond, or we're, we're in this battle, we're in this arbitration case. Well, on August 31st, out of the blue, Chesapeake settles our same class action with, or proposed attempts to settle with another group of attorneys in federal court and that deal was is that they would give the landowner 55% of the deductions that they had been taking and also in the future after September 1st only to withhold 72.5% instead of the full 100. So of course you know we have this lawsuit going on and I, so I was driving back golfing and I had a couple beers actually I wasn't driving and um, my secretary texts me this and says you know 
I won't, <laughs> use is one of those uh, acronyms. Um, it says, what is this, I'll say. And I look at the thing and I said, well, this can't be my case. It's, it's only um, seven and a half million or saying in back settlement. And then once we start looking, I said, my God, I, I don't believe that this is what, what is going on here. Um, so what do we do? Um, we represent around 140 individuals now. Uh, we have around 4,000 acres that we represent. The case, this Demchak case by these other lawyers, I think they represent 13 uh, individuals and maybe, maybe around 500 acres or so. So we filed a motion to intervene. Uh, there's been other people that have filed to intervene. Uh, it's a, it is an enormous legal battle and everything has been placed on hold. And again, they filed it in federal court with Chesapeake's approval uh, with these other attorneys. So, this is something that, you know, if you have any interest in this, um, following this part of things is just a, it's really an amazing issue. It is a billion dollar issue. Now, I talked about Chesapeake's partners, and they're not taking deductions, but check this out. We have thousands of leases that have this language. Cabot, WPX, Shell, Ultra, Statoil, Mitsui, uh, Southwestern. None of these companies, and they have thousands of landowners that have that language, are taking deductions. What is going to happen whenever this case, if it goes through at 27.5%? What are all those other companies going to do? And we're talking about for the lifetime of these leases, 50 years and more. So this is a potentially, I believe, clearly a multi-billion dollar issue. And it's, being, it's in Pennsylvania courts right now. And you know it's a big, it's a much bigger deal, obviously, out in our area because it's being litigated there. But boy, I'm telling you, if there's anything that you want to follow, this is truly a billion-dollar issue for landowners. And then you talk about the economy of the state of Pennsylvania, the tax money. Where's that money going to go to? So very fabulous, uh, interesting thing to pay attention to, and not just because um, I'm involved. So, okay, uh, I want to get into, you know. I think that the leasing part, you know, leases are five years. I wanted to cover this one part at the end and make sure I have enough time. But you know, with, when you're doing a lease, the biggest thing that you want to do, you obviously, like I said, you want to maximize the compensation. You want to understand what, you want to understand every single word of your lease. I have conference calls with clients that take hours. I have meetings in my office for hours. And I'll go through every single word and explain what that means. And it depends upon what that person wants. But you need to understand your lease. People say, okay, I signed a five-year lease. So in five years, what happens? Well, if the company does nothing, that lease can expire. But what if the company, you hear this all the time, parks a bulldozer out there? What if the company sends a couple guys out there and sticks some ribbons in the ground? You know, what we want to do is try to solidify what that commencement of operations actually means. And a lot of times what you see is merely filing a permit, which is good for a year, is enough. So that's one thing when you see a five-year lease, everyone at first thinks, well, I'm going to start getting royalties within five years. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that. And they can actually lease your property, worst case scenario, in the fifth year, file for a permit, and then maybe you're waiting for pipelines, so they shut that well in. Well, first got to drill the well, then they may shut it in, and then they could shut it in for a couple years until gas starts flowing. And again, that's a worst type case scenario. Um, and there's things that we try to do to protect that. So we talk about leasing and leverage and all of those things. You know, back in 2008, 9, and 10, it was a lot more fun um, because we had a lot more leverage and a lot more power. Um, but today, a lot of it for me, that first meeting with the client is the, that realistic expectations. So we can talk about, you know, you want to maximize the money, but then you get into maximizing the terms. And those terms can be terms for property protection, and to try to control surface activity. And those terms can also be for potential future financial benefit, meaning if you have a strong five-year clause versus a weak clause, it just allows permitting. And then once they start that activity, they go into this secondary term, and I have that HBP, which stands for held by production. Well, I hate that term because held by production, very, very rarely do you see leases at this point held by production. Now, if you signed a lease today, and your lease is for five years, and everybody around you had signed a lease three years ago, well, maybe their leases are about to expire in two years, so the company has to meet those leases or they lose them. 
So a person signing today doesn't maybe necessarily need to worry about such strong commencement of operation language because they can piggyback off of other people. So that's another big thing. The market is constantly changing. I say this on my radio show all the time. If anybody is approached, and not just gas, it pipelines, please know the landman is not your friend. And they, what they first do, I see this all the time, is a great salesman strategy. They befriend the landowner. Yeah, I think we can do this or we can do that. And the landowner walks out, or he walks out of their kitchen or their dining room saying, wow, that's a great guy. He's going back to the company to battle for me and try to do the best he can. Then he comes back and says, oh, gee, shucks. And a lot of times it's in the, the southern accent. Not always. Um, but, you know, these guys are gentlemen. They've been doing this. They travel all around the country. And they said, geez, you know, I can't believe they wouldn't do that. I really, really tried. You know, I'm shocked that they wouldn't do this or do that. And Lance says, well, hey, you know, um, and they have you know, Stoney. Uh, Stoney did the best he possibly could. It's a guy I'm dealing with. I hope he doesn't watch the video. But I like Stoney. Um, but he did the best he could. You know, he, he did the best he could. So what am I going to do? We just might as well sign. Whether, and I, tell her, I say it all the time, I don't care if it's me, but please get somebody and run things by and make sure that you understand because mistakes can cost hundreds of thousands and literally potentially millions of dollars. So you really need to understand because they're not always giving you the best deal, but sometimes they are. You know, I say this too, landmen aren't always uh, lying. You just need to know when they're telling the truth. So. You, you need to have that information. Um, so I want to talk about, okay, this is a very important, I'm going to talk Western Pennsylvania here for a minute. Um, Western Pennsylvania is a lot different, and I know, again, my parents fall into this category now. We have an older lease, and they have free gas to the house, so that's great, but that's what they wanted. I mean, that was the market at the time, and that's what it is. But what happens now is, is because companies lease this property, these older leases are from the surface to the center of the earth, typically. So what happens is, is the company now has the Marcellus Shell rights. So they don't need to necessarily develop right of way. You know, in nor northeastern Pennsylvania, you do a five-year lease. If you don't drill or you don't do something, you lose it. So they're being forced to be active. In western Pennsylvania, if you hold the lease of a, you know, half of Armstrong County under shallow leases, you can just sit on them and develop at your leisure. Price of gas is low. You may not need to develop. There's just no hurry. You don't have timelines ticking. So that's a big uh, disadvantage to western Pennsylvania landers. Also, those older leases are zero to five dollars, full deductions, 12 and a half percent royalties, you know, generally the worst of the worst. But at the time, that was what the market was. So what do you have to do? You're not going to get this second bonus. You have this bad lease. Well, a great, great thing happened. And I used to preach about this on the radio show. Say you have a 100-acre farm. You leased it for $5, 12.5%. The company says, hey, we're going to develop Marcellus. You know, sign this paperwork. This is going to give, give us access for Marcellus. That's where all the big money is. Well, why do they want you to sign this paperwork? Because a lot of these older leases had no pooling or unitization clause language. What that means is, I showed you that grid before. That's like a 600-acre unit. When they're drilling horizontal Marcellus and Utica wells, they go down and they go out. They cover way more than a 100-acre farm. Practically speaking, no company is going to develop a 100-acre piece of property. So what do they need you to do? They need you to agree to allow your property to be pooled or brought together with your neighbors. And what happened was, and this is interesting because back at, when they originally signed, you didn't want pooling as a Western Pennsylvania person because there's what's called the rule of capture. So if I drill a hole in my 100-acre farm and the underground gas migrates to it, I get all the money. I don't want to share it with my neighbor. So that's where you start getting into 100-acre farm guy has his well here. Then the other guy signs the lease that they drill right here, and it's a race to, you know, whose straw sucks up the most gas. But you didn't want to have your neighbor included. So this is the second bite of the apple. 
the Western Pennsylvania guy has an opportunity. The farmer says, hey, now at least here's my chance to get a market price, to try to get up to 15%. Maybe I can do something about the deductions. Maybe I can get some of this money. And this is their opportunity. And I have many calls. My cousin on my road, I had three people who I never knew growing up call me in this circumstance. Very, very big in Armstrong County and other places in Western Pennsylvania. Well, what ended up happening was this great loophole, and I don't know, not that it was a loophole, but this great opportunity um, met into what's called Senate Bill 259, which has since been passed. This law says that, and this is, it's unbelievable to me, um, but this law provides that the companies can, if they have a lease, if they, if they own multiple contiguous leases touching together and have the right to develop those leases independently, meaning that there's no pew, or a pooling clause, they now have the right to develop them together. So these landowners who were saying, hey, this is our opportunity, this is our opportunity, well, the Pennsylvania legislature, um, you know, in my opinion, just shattered that. Well, they did. They shattered that opportunity. So what's crazy, it was part of this bill um, that passed right around the same time as the budget, and it passed in the House by a vote of 167 to 33. Now, there was some check stub information on here. This is the classic stuff that I thought, you know, most people on TV just made up until I saw it, for real. Uh, it's part of this bill that, hey, they're giving you more information on checks. That sounds great. But they also then throw this in, which was heavily lobbied for by EQT, um, and it was passed. So it was passed by the House, 167 to 33, 33 people. Senate, it passed 48 to 2. Two people said no to this. So the, and the media was focused on the budget. And the governor came out and said, uh, let me get my quote, this is just one. I do not believe that anything in Senate Bill 259 expands the ability of an oil or gas operator to define the size of a drilling unit or to expand the ability of an operator to hold by production any parcels of leased land. I, hopefully I'm doing a good job explaining this because what that was said to me was the exact opposite of what the, the law did. So to show you how bad it was, 12 days after this passed and everybody said, oh, this is a good thing for landowners, 12 days after it passed, doesn't become law yet, EQT sues 70 Pennsylvania landowners and gas right owners in one case, which is local in this area. Um, so because now landowners no longer have the ability to even say, give me the 15%. You know, if you were an, a person who didn't lease, and maybe you had um, 20 acres and unfortunately they just never leased your property, but now you're in this area, you're going to get you know, I have leases in Armstrong, about $1,700, 15% royalty. I have leases in Washington, much, much higher. But if you had an older lease, you're stuck at, and those are also 15% and 18%, you're stuck at 12 and a half. You know, you're stuck with the worst of the worst. And that law was passed 48 to 2. You know, the market, by the Senate, you know, the market dictates that that price is so much higher. So, you know, you talk about Western Pennsylvania, it's something, like, and not that I'm some genius, but I, I preached on the radio show, like, hey guys, please organize and understand in Western Pennsylvania, this is your opportunity to get market, at least. You don't have to hold out for five or 6,000, because you're not gonna probably get that, because that's not the market. But the market sure is a heck of a lot better than zero, than, you know, these companies coming in and taking these old leases and paying 12.5%. Um, I don't, and I wouldn't, but uh, those of you in finance, you might want to consider checking out EQT stock, because they sure as heck just accumulated a whole lot of property, which, you know, as of now, they're in an outstanding position. They don't have to pay any more royalties, and they have the, these 12.5% full deduction leases. So a really, really bad law. There's a movement to try to, um, you know, have it withdrawn, and yeah, I, I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, I do question some of the constitutionality, but I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, that's the movement in the, you know, I talked about in the 1800s, we didn't have a lot of law. Well, we're getting new law, but we're also getting new money. And I just saw an article um, yesterday, it wasn't about Pennsylvania, but talking about the lobbyists and the, the companies and the fracking and how much money's going in. You know, we're quickly losing, you know, power within the government 
as far as these new laws, you know, not necessarily so landowner friendly as hopefully you can see. How that was passed 48 to 2 in the Senate, I, I, can't, I just can't even begin to imagine that. Um, I'm going to bump through because I know I don't have a lot of time, so I wanna, there's something else I want to really talk about. You know, final tips here, seek to eliminate the surprise and fully understand. And that's the same I tell everybody with any single contract. Landman walks to your door, first thing you do, you say hold on a second and you put all the pens away. Don't sign anything. You know, you have to understand what you're doing and you need to talk to somebody. And all my clients and everybody, I say, look, send whatever you have to me, I'll look at it for free and tell you if I think I can help you. If you want help, great. And this isn't a commercial, I'm saying this is what you should be doing. You know, talking to somebody and finding out, do I need assistance? And find somebody that you trust and you believe in. Um, you know, l you learn from the mistake of others because unfortunately there's many, many out there and we learn from the body of work. And when they say it's gonna be a five acre pad or a 10 acre pad, well, what about the guy with 27 acre pad? And here's the other thing, it's just funny. They say, yeah, we'll do it under 10 acres. Well, hey, will you put that in writing? Well, we can't do that. We'll do it under 50. Well, can you put 15? We can't do that. How about 20? We can't do that. So, you know, understand that what's not in writing can occur, and that's the phase we see now. We talk about the wave. We're seeing this domination in this company strong arm in northeastern Pennsylvania now, and it's going to come to western Pennsylvania. And it's already there in places, but it's going to come. So you need to understand, you need to learn what, what's going to happen in five years from now. Well, in 2008 in northeastern Pennsylvania, nobody knew because there was no examples. But now we have examples. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot possibly tell you how many times that I'm asked, and understandably, and it's a, probably one of the first questions I would ask, how much money am I gonna get? I have 100 acres, how much money am I gonna make? Um, you know, what's this really gonna do? And I give them my classic lawyer answer, uh, it depends, and I can't tell you. Uh, and here's the reasons why. Uh, production is based on how much gas is produced from your unit and what your acreage share is in that unit. So I just listed variables to tell you why. Um, you can, I have clients that have 100 acres that are getting less than $1,000 a month. I have a client who has 10 acres who's getting at least $10,000 every single month. I have other clients that are getting 30 to 100,000 and I have others that are getting 50 to $100. So it's all over the board, but here's some of the variables. You know, somebody asked you that question. Well, how many acres do you have? I have 100 acres leased. Then the question becomes, how many acres do you have in that unit? Because if you have 100 acres and you have two in the unit and at 98 aren't in the unit, you only get gas from what's in that unit. Now, other units will come along probably if it's a productive area and you'll get development from those units. But if you have two acres in a unit and I have five acres in a unit and we both have the same royalty percentage, I get more than double the money that you get. But when your other property comes in, then you're gonna get paid for that. So that's an enormous variable, how many acres you have in a unit. Well, let's say that you have 100 acres in a unit. Well, what if the price of gas is $2? Well, if it's $2 versus $4, you're gonna get twice as much royalty if it's $4. So the price of gas is an enormous variable. Nothing's probably a bigger variable than the, pr the production numbers of the, of the wells. There are enormous discrepancies. So if you have 100 acres in a great well at $4, you're gonna make a heck of a lot more money than 100 acres in a very poor well at $2. It's just impossible to tell you what you're gonna do. Then also, number of wells. Some of those units will have six wells in the unit producing. Well, if you have six wells versus one well, and you have you know, good wells or bad wells, you can get an idea of what they're gonna be. 18%, 20%, or do you have 12.5%? An enormous variable. How, are you getting post-production costs taken? 20, 30, 40 percent. Enormous. Are wells shut in? These wells decline very rapidly at times depending upon where you are. So all of these things, so do a big example, 100 acres, um, it, you say you have one well producing a two dollar gas and that's it. Or, and it's a, a poor well. And then take the flip side and say I have 100 acres, I have six wells, $4 gas, and there's six of the better wells in Pennsylvania. Your royalty check is gonna be astronomically bigger than the other. And just to give you a real quick last thing, um, this is a real production, pick this just because we like the name, um, gives you an example here. The, the, the first set was 
Both were producing the same amount. These one H is the first horizontal, four H is the second, inside of the same unit. For the same amount of days, 4-H produced almost double. Next one down, for the same amount of days, 1-H produced five times more than 4-H. Then the next month, it was double, but the, the days were double, but the time was, as far as it was 29 days on 1-H, 70 days on 4-H, but 4-H produced 10 times the amount of gas in double the days. So if anybody can make rhyme or reason in this, I would challenge you to do that. Nicholas might be able to from that one problem that he solved. But you can't, nobody, if, if they, I'm telling you, if somebody tells you that they can tell you, it's one of two things. Either they don't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you. And that's the bottom line. So we'll take questions. I know we probably went a little longer there, so thank you. situation where there's greater power with more landowners controlling more land. Yeah, no, absolutely that can work in ways. And, you know, I, I personally never have represented a group banded together. I've represented multiple people at a time. Um, it, it, there's, these groups have created what I call super leases, which have been wonderful, where they drive up the price where 30, 40, 50,000 acres signed together. And that's really what took that price from 2,500 to 5,750 per acre. So groups can be wonderful. The problem that you can run into with groups, and I think you always have to try to explore the group situation, but not everybody in the group has the same interest. And sometimes maybe you don't want to have surface activity in your property and somebody else says, drill in my living room. Uh, you may have certain restrictions that you want to have a part of the, your agreement and that they don't. So financially, a lot of these group leases do much better. But they're not, you know, you get a cookie cutter lease, it might not be right for everyone. Another problem with groups is a lot of times they don't educate their, their people, their, you know, their landowners and their clients. And again, I'm a very big believer in understanding every single thing in your contract because I see what happens when people don't and see that second side. But I think you absolutely explore them. I think you talk to your neighbors. It can help bring up the price. But you've got to watch with groups because the other thing that happens with groups is maybe this guy is willing to accept um, $1,000.15%, but the group wants 2018 And the group doesn't get what they want. Maybe the company moves away or doesn't lease anybody. And he, this one individual could have signed. Um, so you explore it. It can be very, very valuable. But now you really have to, you know, it used to be you could use a scooper and just scoop everybody into a class. Now you have to have a scalpel to figure out, okay, what is this group's leverage? So it can be very helpful, but you need to understand exactly what your leverage is. And even if you're a group and you have a thousand acres, if you only have one suitor, you know, you have to understand that and you're going to maximize it. So still there can absolutely be beneficial, but you have to watch out for the pitfalls and you need a good group representative. You need somebody that you trust and you need to be involved in the process. Um, in recent developments where good crude oil is being found or wet gas, maybe the Utica shale formation, um, is that changing any of the dynamics of the marketplace? You know, <laughs> I would say that it, it is, it, recently, I had, and I, I don't like to get into too much numbers because there sometimes gets to be confidentiality aspects when the numbers get up there, but I'll say this, that Washington County recently, uh, and you go into this, I find we're, and we're, we're very fortunate, and we can tell when leasing starts active, you know, activating in a certain area because we start getting calls from that area. Now, it doesn't mean they're always going to be our clients, but we start getting calls. So I haven't had a lease file, uh, an active lease file in Washington County in a little while. And then over the last six months, I had, we've done probably 15 separate leases. And they've been for extremely, uh, well, very high numbers compared to what we've seen, and actually higher than what I'm currently seeing in the northeastern part of the state. And 
the reality is, is that's driven by geology in a lot of these areas. And in fact, I just got a counter back today. I checked my emails and they went up a few thousand dollars per acre than what they were offering. Uh, and that's totally driven by geology and that's where we're coming into when you're getting into some of these wetter plays. And it, it's, it's really interesting for me because I don't know, it's exciting and sometimes exciting in a fun, beneficial way for the landowner and the client, but sometimes it's, hey, all offers are off the table and we're done. Um, so it was a lot more fun in 2008, 9, 10 where we're, you know, keep, these numbers keep blasting up. But now, you know, it's so difficult because the numbers can go up and down in a heartbeat. But I've recently seen um, very nice numbers, but they could, that company could turn around and say, hey, landowner, I don't want to shut that off for a second, but my client would have taken much less <laughs> because we had no choice. Um, but geology um, can drive it. So, and then it's an individual. You know, some people won't. They'd rather just sit there. Yeah. An interesting issue, um, what post-drilling actions are or can be specified to deal with property restoration after production has started, dealing with leakage, decay, water seepage, yeah, and it's, I mean, that's an, it's an interesting question, and I think that people, you would think that you can negotiate these type of items into the lease, and generally speaking, it's really driven by, you can do reclamation, surface reclamation, um, reseeding, original contours, how are you going to fix this surface of the property, the grass, the trees, things like that. That's something that when you have leverage, and even today, we can typically address. But when you talk about environmental issues, it's really driven by you know, the statutes and regulations. If I try in a negotiation today to put in some sort of environmental language, they literally would laugh at you. Maybe not right in front of you, but they just, it's unheard of. You just can't do it. It's driven by you know, regulation and statute. They just won't do it. One other thing you have to watch out for, Everything is a battle with precedent. You know, fighting, making precedent, uh, trying to justify precedent, companies not wanting to set precedent. The second somebody gets some sort of term in there that addresses some sort of environmental issue that they don't really want to have in there, well, every single person in the world is going to want that term then. So they don't want to set environmental terms. So there are some super, what I call those super leases, the big group leases, that will have environmental language in there. But in my experience, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it tracks the regulations that are in, effe in effect anyway. So the, they're real nice to kind of sell to the landowner when you see you have a 30-page lease. Um, it has all this environmental language, but that environmental language is also codified in regulations and statutes. So it's really that you're not getting anything. It just looks pretty. Um, so you typically can't do much, usually nothing, on environmental issues, you're left to those regulations. But on the surface reclamation, you can certainly do things. And we didn't talk about it all, like pipelines, and people may get pipeline agreements, and that's, I do more pipeline work than anything now, and we do incredible things with pipelines, because now we, we have that leverage again. So pipelines is the fun thing for me to work on now. Um, you don't always have leverage when you do, boy, it's, it's a nice thing to work on. And we work on, you know, depth, um, you know, what you're planning. We're going to have the biggest, fattest deer in northeastern Pennsylvania because all these clients want food plots. So we got these, they got, they got, you're having these deer thinking they're in heaven until a couple weeks from now, or until a week or so. But it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. But you can do depth. There's a lot of different things you can do. And pipelines, if you have a pipeline agreement, please put the pen away and don't sign. Um, you've seen cases where numbers go from 20,000 to 250,000 if your leverage is right. Not always, <laughs> believe me, not always, but if your leverage is right. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions here and then we'll have to call it quits. Um, any idea of what's going on with uh, these property rights, gas rights in New York State? So if you have property that's right on the border of northern Pennsylvania, southern New York State. Well, I mean, there's, in, if you're in New York, nothing is going on. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, there's a moratorium now, and, and it, it, I believe ultimately it'll be lifted, um, but there's nothing going on. And you can talk to people, and people say it's going to get lifted all the time. I, you know, I don't know. I can't predict it, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't know how anybody else can. Um, there's also the Delaware River Basin Commission who issues water permits in the eastern part of Pennsylvania. 
and actually our property that our family owns out there is in that Delaware River Basin Commission, so there's no permits being issued for water withdrawal, so, and that feeds that, that commission and that water ways feed um, New York and Philadelphia, so they won't grant these, and it's a big battle, uh, and I'm not involved in it. Um, but, you know, there's no permits being issued, so there's no sign that that's going to change anytime soon. So, I mean, that could literally be years away. But what you see sometimes is, you know, you get, I have clients who are right on the border of game lands or state lands, and recently we've got some higher offers from them because they want to drill and use their property as a staging to go under the game lands because the, the state doesn't want the drilling on the property. So those properties have become more valuable. And it's one of those cases, if you're an individual and you don't know this and you haven't seen this before, you may sign at 100% less than what you could have signed at. So you really need to know what the market is and what's available to you. Probably the most controversial question for Russ. Is the water after fracking toxic? <laughs> well, uh, the second after? Uh, it, it depends. <laughs> it depends. Um, I mean, it, there's, that's a tough question. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're not going to drink the water that's coming out of the well. I mean, they, 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 what they do now, a lot of companies, what they're doing is they're collecting it right there and they take it to these treatment facilities. They treat it. Um, Cabin, for example, has this mobile treating facility. Not that it drives around. It's enormous and they build it somewhere. So, but they take the trucks, they take it there, they treat it, they get the levels down, and then they go back and they use that same water. I mean, companies have become much, much better at doing you know, in processing this and treating it and not having these accidents. But when that water comes back up, that's called produced water, and there's the brine and the chemical. You can't drink that water. But what you hear with the, the water and the people that have problems in the wells, and it, you know, it's a touchy issue. Um, I represent hundreds and hundreds of landowners. I haven't had a person contact me to sue a gas company for water contamination. Um, many of my clients, they do water tests before and after they drill, and I'm, this is not pro-drilling, this is just what the information is. They'll do these water tests and many of my clients have elevated methane levels in their water already. It just, it exists already. Um, so I haven't had a case, when we get the pre and post tests, where the levels have really gone up high. I've had one where the levels spiked up and then after a little bit of time, like a matter of a month or so, they went back down. And what you had for some of the big problems at the original was this, not so much the chemicals, and to my knowledge still, I don't know that there's any chemical pollution of um, aquifers that we're aware of, but what you have is this what they call methane migration, where the, the gas is coming up, and, and what they had in Dimmick, which is the heartland of the issues, was the casing issues, where the gas, this is my theory, I guess, uh, and I think it's a lot of others, where it migrated through the casings that they hit faults and had cracks, and it went into the people's water. The gas did, not the chemicals, but the actual methane gas, and that's where you're lighting your faucets. But I've talked to, I've literally talked to people who said, we lit our water or lit our faucets before. Not pro-gas, like saying, hey, this is wonderful. I'm just saying this is what's been relayed to me. What I find sometimes too, and I'm not, again, I, I don't want to overstate that this isn't a gas commercial here. Um, but I've found in my history that I don't get the complaints from the 100-acre landowners when there's issues or the 50-acre or 200. But I understand, if you have five acres and you bought this property, you've lived your, your whole life and you're not getting any major financial reward from this, and there are truck after truck after truck, and your roads beat up, and you're, you know, it's noisy, and there's flares, and there's lights, it's ugly, it's an industrial park, it's not what you signed on for, maybe you bought the property and lived to, to retire out there, it's a nightmare. I mean, for those people, it's a nightmare. And so you tend to see a lot more complaints from people in those positions than the 100-acre person is really getting a, a great benefit from it. But not to say, again, that, you know, these problems occur. Uh, I'm not on either side of it. I'm on the side of let's make sure that we do it, we do it as the right way. Let's make sure that we make our contracts as strong as we possibly can for the landowner to try to avoid these problems. And if you have a problem, you can prove it's their fault then let's go in the court and let's make sure that you're taken care of. Okay, thank you very much, Derek. Thank you.